this past spring, I planted a garden. Now, you should know up front, I'm not a very good gardener, but I am trying to learn. I tried to pick items that we would really eat, and Kaylin, our nine-year-old, had a special request for strawberries. So I planted eight small strawberry plants, and after a while, I began to see the berries appear. I was excited. The novice farmer was doing okay. But after a day or so, I began to notice something was eating Kaylin's strawberries. Birds. Now, my gardening skills are already questionable, so I don't need birds coming in here eating what little I've been able to grow. So I covered the strawberries with bird netting. This is simply a net you can put over plants like strawberries that lets the sunlight and the rain through, but keeps the birds away. This is similar to what St. Paul is addressing with the Colossians in this morning's epistle. The seeds of their faith have been planted. They have begun producing some fruit. But someone is coming in and beginning to create trouble for them, creating division, leading people astray. The reason for Paul's writing to them is this confusing teaching has come into the church. Misleading ideas have begun spreading. Most likely, scholars think, a shaman-like person who claimed to have superior spiritual insight was luring members into various beliefs and rites and rituals that promised protection from evil spirits or afflictions, and it was probably rooted in Jewish and pagan folk belief. Now, we might hear this and think, well, that's kind of weird. That's kind of odd for them. But is it a problem today? It is. Churches today can get pulled into other beliefs and practices that promise some protection or prosperity or enhanced religious experience. And of course, churches are made up of people. And when individual people get pulled into these things, the body of Christ often gets pulled into their wake as well. And here's the issue that many people don't that seem many people seem to miss. It always sounds good. It always sounds plausible. It always sounds harmless. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. Otherwise, it couldn't lead us astray. Sometimes this comes in the form of popular spiritual books written by Christian-sounding people who promise this new knowledge or greater experience or special blessing of health or wealth or prosperity or favor with God. I've seen it in some of our young people who have handed over to me crystals and charms that they have been using for various things, including luck and all sorts of other things. There's the notion of syncretism. The mixing of various non-Christian religious practices into Christianity, usually Eastern. And additionally, there are a number of competing philosophies that seek to influence the church. And I'll address some of those in a moment. The point is, this simply isn't a temptation limited to our ancient forefathers, but a real issue for the modern church today. It's as if the Colossians are like my strawberries. They need a spiritual netting. They need a way to let in what is needed for growth. They also need to filter out the things that threaten their life of faith. And so do we. And so it's against this backdrop that we begin to dive into Colossians. Please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, beginning at the 6th verse. And let's see how the Apostle Paul encouraged and strengthened the church at Colossae to face these challenges. Now, verses 6 and 7 are a strong admonition. They say, Therefore, as you, that is the congregation, received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There's a lot to unpack in that single, in those two verses. But I think the overarching idea is to remember. Paul's first point here is for them to remember that they have received Christ Jesus as Lord. 
Now let's talk about that for a moment. In the New Testament, to receive Jesus went much deeper than simply praying a prayer. It meant that the gospel had been preached and the hearers had responded in faith. Being baptized, they committed their lives in obedience to Jesus as Lord. And that definition is still true today. It is critical for us, even if we've been attending church for years, to know that in the fullness of this idea that we have indeed received Christ Jesus as Lord. And assuming this, Paul says, walk in him. So we must remember to live it. As you have received Christ, so live. Live in obedience to him. Anglican Dick Lucas says, True conversion implies the right of Christ to rule and therefore to determine the shape and character of what in his eyes is worthy of consistent living. So the the first way we fight the disparate voices we hear around us, the calls to compromise our faith or to add to it for some mystical promise is to remember that we have received Jesus Christ And to walk in him in the light of his lordship. Secondly, in verse 7, Paul says for them and us to be rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. And that symmetry rolls back in on itself. As you were rooted in the gospel, build on that foundation, which is established in the gospel basics. In the faith of the gospel. This is a call to growth. This is a call to avoid apathy and spiritual laissez faire Christianity. Few things are as detrimental to our faith as laziness. As we are rooted in Christ, so we should grow and be built up in Christ. Thomas Burgler has written a book that. I think may have one of the best titles I have heard in a long time. It's long, so hang on. Here's his title. From Here to Maturity, Overcoming the Juvenilization of American Christianity. It's a fantastic book. And in it, he says, spiritual growth to maturity requires that our thoughts, choices, and feelings all work together under the influence of God's grace and truth. Our thoughts, our choices, and our feelings working together under the influence of God's grace and truth. That is a process. That is a process of being rooted and built up. It is an intentional process to which all disciples of Jesus are called to engage in. It doesn't happen accidentally. I mean, it's like having a gym membership, right? I've had a gym membership for a year and a half, but man, nothing is happening. Got to actually engage. And this is the work that we are engaged in in our family of faith here at St. Patrick's. Our worship, our fellowship, our growth groups, Sunday school classes, service projects, mission trips, and catechesis are all part of growing in our faith. And at the risk of stepping on some toes, I must say you cannot get that coming to church once every four to six weeks. Thirdly, St. Paul says in verse 7 that we should be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What's he referring to here? Well, St. Paul knows how they were taught. He taught them. And his students continued teaching them after he left. His encouragement here is that the Colossians continue in the truth of the gospel teaching that they first received. You never outgrow the basics. This is why we teach Christian essentials first And then Anglican essentials. Again, I think Dick Lucas is helpful. He says, The Christian who grows in knowledge can claim fuller enlightenment only insofar as he remains loyal to the saving gospel truths 
that he was first taught, which led him to Christ. So all of this then should naturally cause us to abound in thanksgiving, as St. Paul says. The word abounding literally means overflowing. For the Christian, our thanksgiving gives glory to God and acknowledges our dependency on God. Thanksgiving grounds us in his goodness and reminds us that we are not the center of the universe. We have no sense of entitlement, no presumption of favor, save for the goodness of God in Jesus Christ himself. And for that, we overflow with thankfulness. St. Paul knows the pressures that are swirling around the Colossian church, the confusion that can get in our heads and pull us off track in our faith. So he reminds them in us, as you have received, live. As you were rooted, grow and be thankful. But he's going to get more specific in the verses that follow. And so are we. Look at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Let's unpack this one a bit. Paul's chief concern is that they, and by extension we, not be caught up in captivity. And the word that he uses here refers to the capturing and the imprisoning of a person. Paul knows that we can be made captive, our lives derailed, our Christian lives shipwrecked, when we are taken captive to philosophies that oppose, supplant, or modify the gospel. Now, let me add, philosophy is not a bad word. And it is not necessarily contrary to the Christian faith. It literally means love of wisdom. And of all people, Christians should love wisdom. Wisdom, And we have some books in the Bible that deal specifically with that. According to the Oxford Dictionary, philosophy is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. And we know that St. Paul himself was trained in philosophy and religion. And the key to his argument here is that when philosophy and tradition are divorced from the gospel of Christ... Now, the truth is, we all follow a philosophy of some sort. You can't escape it. You have things which drive your approach to knowledge and reality and existence. Paul's caution is that when we do this as Christians, we do this according to Christ. With the gospel as the lens through which we come to our understanding of these things. Now, the truth is, there's a lot of what he terms empty philosophy out there today. And I'm going to go through a few of the popular ones. So, preaching's about to go to meddling, as we say. The first off is hedonism. The belief that pleasure is the most important thing in life. This may be the most dominant philosophy we see in the world around us. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Life to the hedonist is about the pursuit of pleasure. And it's not that Christians are anti-pleasure, but I understand why people get that idea based on the way some Christians act. I get it. But no, we are not against pleasure. God is the author of pleasure and goodness. But it becomes distorted, doesn't it? It becomes distorted by our sin. The psalmist says, wine gladdens the heart. We turn it to drunkenness. God created sex. We turn it into perversion. The food he gives us, we turn into gluttony. Pastor David Robinson, Robertson has said, and I love this line, the pursuit of pleasure apart from God is like trying to quench your thirst with salt water. It never satisfies. The bigger house, the better job, The new marriage, the new car, the next high, the next party, all fail to deliver on their promises. In our culture, hedonism is everywhere, and it seeks to influence the church and you. Reject the, if it feels good, do it philosophy. Do not be taken captive by hedonism. Next, individualism. 
This is the philosophy of the primacy of self. This is the root of of the entitlement and narcissism we see so prevalent today. Everything is rooted in me, myself, and I. This creates, ironically, terrible loneliness and isolation. Friends, as Christians, we know and confess that we were built for community. God called a people to be his people. Jesus created a community of apostles, which in turn created a community of believers we call the church. It's not about you. It's not about me. Even in the church. Sometimes we forget this and you hear things like, I don't like this song. I don't like this prayer. I don't like this carpet. I don't like the priest's beard. That's actually been said to me, by the way. It's not about you or me. It's about us. It's about us. Our entire liturgy testifies to this. When we pray our Father, when we pray we confess, or we, can, or we say we believe, do not be taken captive by the radical individualism we see around us. Thirdly, and I've only got four, just so you know, so you're not like, oh my gosh, this could go on for hours. <laughs> it could, but we're not going to do that. Thirdly, relativism. This is the philosophy of no absolutes. Everything is relative. You do you. you. Heard that before? Your truth is your truth. I can't tell you how many times I have heard Christians say this. It is hopeless, and I'm sorry, stupid. It just is. It's a self refuting statement. There are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure about that? The Christian faith and our Christian lives are not based on relativism, but on the certainty, the absolute certainty that God is, God loves, and God sent his son to redeem sinful humanity and guide them into the truth. We also believe that the Bible is authoritative for us and communicates God's truth to us, which is timeless and objective. What God calls sin is sin. What God calls good is good. When God says he loves, he loves. When God says he forgives, he forgives. Don't be taken captive by relativism. Fourthly, and the last of the four that I'm going through, though I thought of like six more that I could have done, but fourthly, modern sexual philosophy. It goes by a number of different names, and this could be an entire sermon in itself, but modern sexual theory says that sexuality doesn't ultimately matter, nor does gender. In many ways, it's a combination of all the other three, hedonism, relativism, and individualism. It intentionally denigrates the traditional understanding of marriage and the family. It blurs the lines of gender and sex and is absolutely taking captive an entire generation of our kids and a number of adults. This philosophy is pervasive in society in almost every area. Make no mistake, it is far from a liberating take on sexuality. It will take us captive if we let it. And it is absolutely dehumanizing humanity. This free-for-all philosophy has driven porn, prostitution, and sex trafficking to all-time highs. Did you realize that in the United States, a child is bought or sold for sex Every two minutes. And the average age of these children that are being sold is 13. That's the average. Human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise behind drug trafficking. This is the fruit of the modern sexual ethic. Many are confused and taken captive by it. And society will scorn you for rejecting it. But do not get caught up in modern sexual philosophy. 
The Colossians were falling into the trap of certain philosophies that threatened to derail their faith, that would lead them into spiritual captivity. And St. Paul throws a net over them to protect them. He calls them to remember, to remember. Remember you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Remember to walk in him, rooted and built up and established in your faith. Remember what you were taught. Remember to abound in thanksgiving. And friends, we must do the same. He warns them specifically about being taken captive by philosophies rooted in human traditions and not according to Christ. Why, ultimately, don't you need what they have to offer? And Paul tells them why. Verse 9, for in him, Christ, and nowhere else, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him. You don't need this other stuff. Verse 12, you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith, and I love this line, in the powerful working of God. You don't need what they offer. What is it that you seek that Christ does not offer? Really? He is the ultimate source of love and peace and rest and guidance and forgiveness and grace. And Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have been given everything, everything God has to offer you. If you will just remember and take hold of it. God intends for you to bring forth a rich harvest that blesses you and gives glory to him. The seeds of faith have been planted in you. Whether you have been walking with the Lord two days or 20 years. Care for it. Jealously guard it from anything that would threaten or diminish your focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. May our lives be radically transformed, strengthened and blessed by the Lord Jesus, who has given us all things. To him be the glory. Amen.